Hey guys, if you tuned in a second ago, uh, apologize for that kind of going haywire. Um, Facebook Live, gotta love the technology and then sometimes not. Anyway, my name is Kendall Young and I am the owner and broker here at Diggs. And this is Thursday Thoughts, where we answer the questions that have cropped up during the week for our brilliant and very curious Diggs clients. In this particular episode, we're going to hit three of your questions and they're all really, really good ones. So I hope that all of you stay tuned and I hope that Facebook Live allows us to continue with our connection. So let's get to to it. Uh, Jennifer C, I think it's Cho, but anyway, Jennifer C is asking, how do I get to the next house? Her full question is, I saw the house of my dreams and I really want to buy it, but I have a house that I'm living in now and all of my money is tied up in the equity in this particular house. So how can I buy this house? Um, well, the really sad answer to that is you probably can't. And the reason that you probably can't um, is that I know that this home is uh, attracting multiple offers and it is just not something that uh, a seller is going to accept. They're not going to accept an offer contingent upon the sale of your house. Um, and so sadly, I think that this is not a home you're going to get to buy. However, if there's one house out there that is right for you, there's a good chance that there is more than one house out there that's good for you. So what I would recommend that you do, Jennifer, is think about this. Do you, I mean, did this house kind of prove to you that it'd be a good idea for you to move? If it did, then what you want to consider doing is making all of the moves to putting your house on the market, all the time studying whether or not this is what you want to do. And if this is, you really, you need to sell your house first in order to buy your next house. Unless unless you can afford to make an offer non-contingent. And we can help you do the research on that. Uh, sometimes you can get down payments uh, for the uh, purchase from places you're not expecting, like the bank of mom and dad, a short-term loan perhaps for the down payment. Or maybe you can borrow against your 401k. So there's lots of things that, that can be done. Um, hi, Stan from La Crescenta. Lo love seeing you there. Thanks for tuning in. Um, so there's lots of things that you can do, um, and we should research all of those before we kiss anything goodbye. But if we do the research and we find that the only way you're going to be able to buy a house is to get your home sold, then you want to you you really want to check it. If you're committed to going, we need to sell your house, um, and then and then you know find the right house to go. And there's lots of nuances there. So sorry, I'm sure that wasn't exactly the um, answer you were looking for. Yeah, but it's, but it's a good one, right? Okay, um, let's see. Next question comes from Nick C. Uh, Nick C is a potential buyer. He is looking actually to buy his first house. And he asked an incredibly sensible question that I often forget people don't already know. You want to know, how do buyer's agents get paid? Wow, what a sensible question. Um, hi, Dr. Sa. Okay, um, anyway, <clears throat> the, buyer, the buyer's agent gets paid essentially by the home seller. So here's what happens. Uh, somebody who wants to sell their home, they hire a real estate agent and they sign a listing contract. And part of that listing contract is to pay that listing agent a commission once the house actually sells and close escrow. And then that listing agent goes ahead and um, they, that listing agent goes ahead and they designate a portion of that commission to the agent representing the successful buyer. Okay, so if you're a buyer, Nick, and I know that's what you want to be, and you want to buy a house, the great news is that the buyer's agent that you select to work with isn't going to cost you any money out of your pocket. So why wouldn't you have the best buyer's agent you could possibly get, right? So, um, but that's how I buy, and, and the buyer's agent does not get paid until you successfully find a house that you love, get your, ho get your contract accepted, and you can actually then close escrow. Then your buyer's agent gets paid. So let's just say that you give up because you can't find a home that works for you in your budget or you get a 
job transfer, life gets in the way, who knows what happens, and you decide to not buy a house, you are not going to owe anybody any cash. Your love and devotion and referrals perhaps, but not any cash. Okay, so um, I hope that answers your question, Nick. That was a great question. Thank you for that one. Okay, John Z has a really creative idea on how to compete in this market. Now I gotta tell you, if you don't already know this, um, <coughs> this is a really competitive market that we're in. There's not a lot of houses for sale, and there's actually a lot of buyers who are trying to get in to something. Um, many of them first time buyers taking advantage of the still very low interest rates. <coughs> Excuse me, that's a problem with live. I can't like turn off the thing and cough and then come back. So. Um, so John uh, Z, who's been trying to buy a house now for a few months and has gotten pretty frustrated, he came up with this really radical and creative idea for competing in this market. He's decided that he's going to get his real estate license. Um, and then he's going to use the commission that he makes on the deal uh, to basically make his offer more, more attractive. Um, and I know that sounds like a really, really good idea. And it's not that it's, it's a bad one. It's not that it won't work. It, it, it will work. I mean, John Z, I'm not going to lie. Um, it's, it's not bad, but I, I, I suspect it's a lot more complicated than you think it is. So, um, first of all, let's just kind of go through the moving parts. In order to get your license, you need to, um, take all of the courses that are necessary. You can get those online. It's not difficult. Um, and the, co the classes really only, only cost, <coughs> um, a few hundred dollars. Um, for all of the materials and whatnot. <coughs> you can complete the courses. Um, I just did my broker's course. So I think it's, you can complete them in as little as six weeks. Um, but most people aren't that dedicated and it takes them longer than they expect to move through the six courses. And I gotta tell you, some of them are pretty darn dry. The one on appraisals, I thought I was gonna die. Um, seriously, so a lot of math involved, um, pretty dry. So do all of the courses, but let's just say that John Z is a really good student and a really good test taker. He flies through all of the practice tests and everything is fine. Then he needs to take the real estate exam. Um, it, again, it, if you're a good test taker, it's easy as pie. If you're a bad test taker, it's still not too bad, especially if you pay for a review course um, to go through it. Um, so it, like you can probably do that. So let's just say that uh, John Z is amazing and he gets it done inside of the six weeks. So it'll probably take him four months to six months, but let's just say he does it in six weeks. So that's really, really great. So he's paid $400 for the course, a couple of hundred dollars for the licensee fee. That's not too expensive. Um, we want to keep in, keep in mind that he's going to have to pay a portion of that commission, whatever it is that he makes, to the broker that he chooses to align with. Um, there are really cheap cheap options out there where you get to keep almost all of your commission, but you get no guidance, no support, uh, no nothing. Um, and you've got to figure out how to do all of the things in order to actually make an offer. And you didn't learn that in the licensing school. I just have to tell you, you didn't learn anything in the licensing school that you need to actually buy a house just so that you know. All right. So you got to do all that. You got to hope that when you fill out the contract, you don't make any major mistakes. that are going to bite you in the butt later on. Um, the contract is not super, super um, complicated, but there are a lot of ways that you can really shoot yourself in the foot if you don't know what you're doing. So we're going to hope that John C. Uh, fills out the contract and that he doesn't leave himself open to um, major problems uh, during the transaction. To get into all the problems you can get into longer than you guys are going to pay attention to this Facebook live broadcast, but give me a call. I'd be happy to walk you through some of the potential pitfalls um, during a transaction because you didn't fill out the contract um, in the best way possible. So there's that. And then, um, John Z, I want you to remember that you need to pay income tax. I shouldn't say need because I'm not a tax advisor, so I don't know all of the ins and outs of taxes. Oh, Simone, you're the best. If you guys haven't met Simone yet, you should. She is a goddess. She just brought me water. Thank you. Come here, Simone. Say hello. Hi. There's Simone. Thank you. Okay. Yay. Okay. Um, so 
so given that I'm not a tax advisor, you want to um, check with a tax advisor to make sure that you are not going to be liable for the tax on the commission that you make. Because I'm guessing that 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 uh, John C. thinks that he's just going to be able to say, look, um, I'm representing myself. I'm not going to take a commission and everything is going to be great. So my offer is actually higher than another buyer's offer that is not offering the commission back. And that sounds intellectually like a really great plan but it might not be from a tax standpoint so make sure that you talk that you talk to a tax advisor so that you're not going to be facing a very unpleasant tax bill at the end of the fiscal year so um, once all of that is done um, John Z you're probably going to be netting several thousand dollars no joke, several thousand dollars. But here's the last kicker, and I do not mean any disrespect, but you are not a professional real estate negotiator. You might be a negotiator in um, the line of work that you are in currently, but you are not a real estate negotiator. You have not been through the thousands of deals that we have here at Diggs. And so you may not understand exactly the best way to negotiate all the little details that go into a real estate transaction that are necessary to make sure that you not only get the best contract price, but the contract price is just the start, it's just the titch of the iceberg, that you need to make sure that you are able to negotiate every point of the way, and there are four four separate negotiations in every single transaction. So four times you need to be aware of where the pitfalls are and four times you need to be skilled, intelligent, which you are, I've met you John, you're very intelligent, but also um, knowledgeable and, ex and, and experienced in all of those nuances so that you can be sure that you are hopefully getting the very best deal possible. But honestly, that's not even the case. It, what's more important is that you don't, you don't put yourself in jeopardy financially or legally. Um, because of your because of lack of experience or whatnot so it's it's not a simple thing so so I just want to say John it, it's a really creative idea um, but it's probably not going to have as much benefit to the seller as having a really great experienced negotiator who's negotiating on your behalf might be um, that you should be really really careful about what you're doing so um, that's it. Those are the three top questions that we had um, from our incredibly wonderful, curious, and intelligent Diggs clients. If you have any, actually there's some questions that have been asked here, so let me see if I can um, get in there. Uh, oh, okay. Adriana wants to know, how can a buyer compete with a no contingency offer. Wow, that's a really tough one. Um, in urban Los Angeles, it's actually pretty common for buyers to make offers without the three, without one or all of the three major contingencies. First one is going to be a loan contingency. Second one is your appraisal contingency, and the third one is your home inspection contingency. Right, and so buyers, in order to compete um, and not pay a huge price, and in urban Los Angeles, some of them are still paying huge prices. Um, they're making offers without one, some, or all of these contingencies, contingencies because what these contingencies do, they were designed to protect you, the buyer, if, if you're the buyer, from unnecessary, from, from, from the unknown, from risks, right? Um, and they protect the buyer and it shifts the, the, the risk of the unknown from the buyer to the seller. So if you make an offer non-contingent on, say, the inspection, you're taking on the risk of something unknown. Because the seller has to tell you anything that they know that's a problem, right? We're just talking about unknown stuff. So you're shifting the risk of something that's unknown from the seller, uh, from you, the buyer, where it is right now, and you're shifting it to the, to the seller. Sorry. I, I've got that completely back and I've got, I've got a text message coming in. Sorry about that, guys. You're shifting it that is currently with 
the seller, that's the way the contract is right now, the seller takes all the risks because they say, um, go ahead and inspect my property and if you find anything you don't like, then we'll talk about it before everything is set in stone, right? And if you don't, we can't work it out, then you're gonna go and buy another house and I've gotta go through the whole process of marketing the home and finding another buyer. So all the risk is on the seller, the way the contract is right now. By taking the inspection contingency out, you shift the risk from the seller to the buyer and what we're basically saying is mr. seller I'm I, I'm good with this house and I'm gonna take it at face value that you have given me as accurate a picture as you can about the condition of your house I'm good with it and if I discover something later on I'll just deal with it on my own dime and my own time obviously the sellers uh, find that very very attractive and if you were to be bold and to make an offer non-contingent on inspection, you're going to look better than potentially an even higher price contract that has that contingency in it. Now, as a broker, I cannot and will not recommend that you take that risk, okay? That's not a risk that, I, uh, that I'm telling you to do. I am merely telling you that there are buyers out there who are doing that, and if you're competing against one of those buyers and you do have an inspection contingency, it's likely that you're going to lose. So if you want to discuss ways to do things like that and mitigate your risk, we have lots and lots of techniques that we can share with you that will help you be competitive competitive, um, maybe potentially even remove a contingency and yet lessen the risk of removing those contingency. And we're delighted to talk to you anytime. Just give us a call. Um, my phone number directly is 818-482-1885. Um, if you want to talk about the details of how that would work. Okay. Um, see if we have any other questions. Um, hi, Armina. Nice to see you, girlfriend. Um, Oh, my brother's on there. Hi, Eric. Um, okay, so that is um, all that we have for Diggs Thoughts, Thursday Thoughts today. So if you have any questions that you want to ask us, even if you're not one of our clients, feel free to ping us, um, info at Glendale Diggs, D-I-G-G-S. Give us an email. Um, go onto our Facebook page, our website. There's a million ways that you can find us. We're delighted to answer your question here on the show or privately. Um, so that's it for now you guys have a great day bye